creativity tends to arise when it's lowered a little bit, not when it's zero, you know, you don't want to be unthinking completely. That's when you're asleep, but that it's, it, it's relaxed a little bit. And I think that being in the shower can actually contribute to that. The, the classic four stages of the creative cycle. The second one is the incubation phase that matches with the release phase of the flow cycle. Um, but the deep embodiment trigger seems to work really, really well for the release phase too. Like research done by my friend Lee Slodoff found that building model airplanes and building model dinosaurs is perfect for the release phase for folks for the same reason the shower works. It's low grade. You're not really paying attention. You're paying some attention and it's enough to kind of kick it over. What does it take to do the impossible? What does it take, what does it take to level up your game like never before? What does it take for individuals, organizations, for even institutions to achieve paradigm shifting? Nothing is ever the same again, breakthroughs. Our mission is to decode the neurobiology of flow and cognitive peak performance. Access the minds of maverick scientists, groundbreaking innovators, and world-leading experts to understand what it takes to achieve ultimate human performance. So you can feel your best, perform your best, and accomplish your boldest goals. I'm your host, Rian Doris, and together with best-selling author Stephen Kotler, I present to you Flow Research Collective Radio. All right, folks, this week we are going to be talking about maximizing creativity and gratitude. And we've got two more amazing special guests for all of you. Our first guest is Dr. Glenn Fox. And Dr. Fox is at the forefront of research on gratitude and human performance. He's a neuroscientist by training. He's the head of program design, strategy, and outreach at the USC Performance Science Institute. He teaches the science of peak performance at USC, leading trainings with leaders and groups, and conducting research on mindset and physiology. And he is also the chief science officer for the C. Ford Foundation, which he's going to tell us a little bit more about. And we've got Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, the notorious SBK. <laughs> Last week on Twitter, Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman shared, sometimes I wonder whether my potential wasn't unlocked so much as it was created deliberately and consciously through many years of dedication and engagement of a ravenous curiosity. And he demonstrates that sentiment amazingly in his work. He is a humanist. Humanistic psychologist exploring the depths of human potential. He writes the column Beautiful Minds for Scientific American and hosts the Psychology Podcast, which we're all huge fans of here at the Flow Research Collective. And Dr. Kaufman has written many distinguished books. Among those is a new release, which he'll also talk more about today, called Transcend, the New Science of Self-Actualization. Steve has been going through that and is loving it, so maybe Steve will talk more about it as well. So yeah, huge welcome. Of Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman and Dr. Glenn Fox. We're really excited to dive in. And to kick off the discussion, I've got a question, or two questions for both of you, which is what accomplishment are you most proud of? And what is the largest contribution you've made to the world that most people don't know about? So, Scott, if you want to take a quick crack at that first off. I'm really proud of the first book I wrote, was called Ungifted Intelligence Redefined. And that to this day remains personally my, my most meaningful accomplishment because I had wanted to write that book my whole life up to that point. You know, so that was like uh, 32 years. Um, well, maybe I wasn't thinking about it when I was one month year old, but let's say about 30 years, the good 30 years I, um, or 25 years, I was obsessed with uh, intelligence and, and, um, and how we're letting so much potential fall between the cracks. So to answer that question, I think it was the publication of, of Ungifted, Intelligence Redefined. My greatest accomplishment that no one has ever heard of is that I was rejected from the TV show American Idol twice. And I haven't told many people. I haven't told many people that. <laughs> I actually I had that in the bio uh, and skipped over it. So I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned that, Glenn. So let me repeat the question for you, Glenn. Um, okay. So yeah, what? Well, firstly, just what accomplishment are you most proud of? And then what's the largest contribution that most people haven't heard of? And maybe they maybe they're the same thing. Um, let's see. Um, biggest accomplishment, if I if I might. Oh, here it is. Here's it. Here's what it is. It's that I've never 
had a job I've been qualified for and I've only gotten paid to learn new things. Mm -hmm. I've never trained up for something and then gone into it. I've always gone up and then gone totally sideways and then somehow gotten paid to do the new sideways thing. By mm -hmm. far biggest accomplishment. I've never had a real oh, job. That's all, that's I've awesome. never gotten paid to do something I've trained to do ever. I've well, always started something good. crazy and just been so lucky that that's been the case for me by far. I get paid to learn stuff. It's number one accomplishment. I love that. Yeah, that biggest unheralded contribution to the world. Well, it isn't, un, I guess, by, by scale. Um, when I was 10, I was in the movie Back to the Future 3, um, and I had a speaking role where I was boy with gun. Um, and um, so I said, here's your gun, Mr. Eastwood. And you can see, and um, it happened. It's a real thing. I've got an IMDb page. Um, and that's probably just by scale. That's by far the most number of people who are probably ever going to see my face on a screen. So um, that's it. Those are probably my two answers. Nice. Stephen, I'm actually super curious because given the first time we've asked this question, um, most people actually don't know your answer to them. So you want to chime in with yours as well? Your biggest accomplishment and then the biggest contribution no one's heard of? No. Um, <laughs> Uh, my biggest accomplishment, I would, I, I would pick Rise as Superman um, as my biggest accomplishment because it was 20 years of research into flow till I, till I could get there. And I think the, 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 my biggest accomplishment that no one's ever heard of is I flew a MiG-17 fighter jet to run an experiment. So one of the big things when we did see that research on flow and creativity that we were looking at is surprisingly just literally the question of what creativity actually is in the first place. So Scott, I wanted to just start things off with that simple question, what is creativity? You know, at the most basic level, I really like Roland May's definition in The Courage to Create, which is, I think is a very underrated book on creativity. He defines creativity as simply putting into being something that didn't exist ever before. So at the most fundamental level, I kind of like that definition of creativity, but I also think that we can define it as doing anything that is novel and meaningful. So if you just have something that is novel just by itself and not meaningful, um, that could be schizophrenia or, or what people call word salads, you know, um, incomprehensible. But if you just have meaningful but not novel, you know, you have a, a boring lecture, you know, where you just understand knowledge. But it's that fusion of both of those things that can really have a utility value for a particular field and uh, make sense to the experts in the field um, and can really move it forward and, and, and make uh, human progress. Mm. Why meaningful rather than useful? It's, a, it's an interesting one. Yeah, so I've heard the word useful a lot and I, don't like useful. It's very against the humanistic psychology spirit that I um, try to espouse these days. Uh, the point of life, according to humanist, humanist, humanistic psychologists, is to reach an end state of life where nothing is for anything else other than what it, what it currently exists. And you can, you can directly apprehend meaning. But as soon as you get to the word of, of utility or usefulness, you start thinking, well, what are, what are things and what use does it serve me? You're not fully appreciating and becoming absorbed in the thing. And, and, and you of all people, uh, the flow guy, um, you know, should know that, you know, the best way to get you out of snap you out of flow is to start thinking, huh, like, is what I'm doing really useful to my goals? You know, but, you know, that's the easiest way to just snap out of it. So I think meaningful, in ca it, it captures the utility aspect of it, but it's, it's something that I think is deeper and more, uh, more, more meaningful, so to speak. Interesting. I like that. So Glenn, what, what's gratitude? Very simply. Yep. Gratitude, there, there's a lot of ways to define it. Um, the more academic definition of gratitude that, that makes a nice place to start is that it's the feeling we have when, the feeling we can have when we receive something that comes at some effort or cost from someone and that fulfills a need uh, for us. It could be a psychological need, a personal need, a you know, Maslowian need or a, or a notorious SBK new Maslow need. That's a reference to his new work. But uh, so it's this idea that, that gratitude, interpersonal gratitude 
is um, a likely result when we get something that that comes at effort that that helps us out. What I think a lot of the time, I think there's varying degrees of gratitude. I think it's a very nuanced emotion. Um, and I think that there are parts of gratitude that are, are similar for things if we receive a, a small gift like somebody holding a door for us, all the way to someone giving us a kidney, of course. And, and gratitude, I think, in, in my telling, is very much tied into the feeling we have when we have a stressor that is removed um, due to the actions of another person, right? So I think oh, gratitude and stress release can be, I think in its most powerful form, are very interweaved. Um, and that's, that's an important distinction because oftentimes we're conflating gratitude with happiness or gratitude, which is general positive um, mm -hmm. um, feeling. And it's, it's, not, it's not to be taken like that. It should be thought of in its very nuanced way where there's almost even an element of pain, not too much, but a little bit of pain and a little bit of that, that very deep vulnerability when someone really bails us out of a tough situation. Interesting. Is, th is there a difference between gratitude and appreciation or is that just semantics? It depends who you ask. So I guess that means it's semantics. Um, right. <laughs> um, you know, I think that, um, I think so. I mean, I think you, it's good to have a little resolution around these terms. I do. I think that, that it's not super important, but I think appreciation is more like, you know, the sun is coming in through the window here very nicely. And I very much can have a moment of appreciation for that. Um, you could just as easily call it gratitude, but I think appreciation, I think, is a more general sense of, ah, oh, this is okay, as opposed to gratitude, which is the way the sun is reflecting off the roof tiles is quite beautiful to me. That feels more like gratitude. The general sense is more appreciation. Um, and it's, it's, it's not actually super important in, unless it helps you resolve and label emotions accurately. Yeah, otherwise there's no utility of the difference yeah. in terms. We have been at the Flow Research Collective, we've been working a little bit with Glenn at the front end of a, a long series of studies on flow and creativity. We've seen already uh, in the early data um, a pretty strong correlation between people with a regular gratitude practice and people with high flow lifestyles. I was wondering about the relationship between gratitude and creativity. You know, the humanistic psychologists, and I can't get any answers, going to be like the humanistic psychologists, but they really talked a lot about creativity and they also really talked about gratitude and, 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 and the linkage between the two because they very much link gratitude to openness to experience. Um, their idea mm. of gratitude was more of like a witnessing um, mm. and more of a sort of being uninhibited by your prior expectations about something. And when you can actually get rid of all those insecurities and prior um, labels and thoughts and, and, uh, and, and judgments about something, and we can just see something purely for what it is, the curious thing about that situation is we tend to find that gratitude almost automatically comes as a result or appreciation, you know? And, and the most creative people tend to show that higher characteristic in what's called newness of appreciation. That was a phrase Abraham Maslow used, newness of appreciation, which is your ability to see something that you've seen a million times before. And every time you see it, it's just as beautiful as the last time you saw it. Or you see something that everyone has become stale to everyone else and you still think it's beautiful, you know? And um, creative people tend to actually score higher in that trait. Interesting. Scott had a wonderful answer. I mean, I do think that, that I, I, I'm, can't pull an exact research article in mind that has looked at creativity and gratitude that I know of um, per se. I just know personally though, that as someone who likes to build and create things, that it's similar to what Scott was saying, that there's something amazing that I think is absolutely rooted in gratitude when we are creating and building something and we're seeing something that nobody else saw. It. It's inherently appreciative. It's inherently grateful to go, wow, I never thought that wood grain could look so beautiful or that paint could lay across a canvas or that a, a, a guitar could sound like that. Um, and it's, it's inherently great, uh, grateful for the medium and the opportunity to um, uh, create and affect something from one's own pursuits. Is, is there also, do you think, a potentially a causal relationship between gratitude into creativity? I know Sean Aker talks about positive affect and how that can heighten things like divergent thinking, which is obviously a big component of creativity. 
can it do you think it can work that way as well scott where you know high, like increasing gratitude can potentially increase creativity well the, the emotions point is actually more complicated because the research shows that those who are able to take seemingly contradictory emotions and be able to experience them at the same time actually are more creative um, I wrote an article about, called the, uh, the emotions, uh, the complex emotions that make us more creative, for instance. So a lot of people tend to cordon off the good and the bad. You know, they'll take, um, you know, either, oh, well, I love the moment. I'm so appreciative of the moment or, oh, I'm so, I'm feeling anger. I'm feeling anxiety. Creative people tend to be really good at taking both sitting with the, the, the contradictory uh, emotions um, that they may be experiencing and, and, and coming to a richer, deeper, meaningful interpretation of that emotion or that experience itself. They don't, they tend to not even think in sort of the, such black and white terms as even the way you asked that question with all due right. respect. <laughs> <laughs> so so it's, the, it's the range of emotion that, like, that can lead to. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Makes sense to me. Well, it makes, yeah, and it makes it makes perfect sense from the affect labeling literature, right? That people who can better put labels on their emotion tend to have be a little better resilience, um, and and tend to be le a little bit less likely to develop um, depression. We see it in our data that emotion regulation ability doesn't correlate with overall average increase in gratitude. This is a little complicated, sorry, folks, but it's not that m people with higher vagal tone or which we'll just refer to as an emotion regulation covariate, that, that people with this higher heart rate variability metric loosely defined, they don't have more gratitude overall, they have a wider range of gratitude, right? Yeah. So there's something about this high definition oh. of gratitude. Yeah, that's this beautiful thing and it, it ties in perfectly with that. And we actually have open-ended questions we ask people, what did you feel alongside gratitude? And mm -hmm. people put often all kinds of contradictory things in there they'll put gratitude and bitterness, which don't, aren't supposed to go together, sadness. But if you really pay attention to, to kind of the modern theory of emotion and how they can be constructed, it makes sense that this is, it's, it's a really an infinite space. And I think the better we get a handle on that, um, the better we're able to take advantage of, of gratitude and its benefits. Stephen, you obviously recommend that people do gratitude practice in our trainings and things like that. And people talk about it as a filter, as another analogy where they start doing gratitude journaling and all of a sudden throughout the day because they know they're going to be doing it again the next morning they're they're you know scanning for things to be grateful for can i fling a question back over to scott please scott, scott. can you can you spin us off a little on do you know anything about post-traumatic growth yeah have i was you, just going to mention that. can you can okay. you riff yeah on that's that? awesome yeah that's oh, yeah. a great point i, I was going to mention that because it's so tied to the idea of meaning making as the core engine not only of creativity, but also of um, over of growth, just in general growth and overcoming trauma. So a lot of people uh, do get post-traumatic stress disorder after a trauma, but the large majority actually grow in some way eventually. And that had been left out of the literature, the psychological literature for many, many years that such people even exist. And it turns out that the number is, is much higher than we realized. Um, and there are very domain, various domains that have been shown to, to show growth after trauma. Creativity is just one of them, but a lot of, a lot of times people will report uh, a greater sense of purpose. They'll report a deeper sense of spirituality, greater connectedness to others in a way that they never felt before, like greater feelings of love they've never had before. And um, they see greater possibilities for themselves. Like they see capacities in themselves they never knew they had, or they see these capacities have in others. And of course, we don't, we, we, we wouldn't prefer that we had the trauma. That's not the point here. But the, you know, as Viktor Frankl said, you know, what other choice do we have? Uh, Viktor Frankl was a, uh, 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 was a humanist, humanist psychologist who was in the concentration camps and wrote a beautiful book called Man's Search for Meaning. He said, even under the most dire of circumstances, you know, even in the concentration camps, he saw people were able to create some sort of meaning and, 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 and the, the thought of their purpose of what they're going to do when they, when they someday, once they can get out of the concentration camp, um, that get them going and showed, um, allowed them to, uh, to, to do amazing things when the, those who were uh, able to to survive that. 
Um, so there's a whole field of study. Um, and there are some great books I could recommend on that uh, by Tedeschi and Calhoun have a uh, post-traumatic growth workbook that I would recommend, for instance. I get no royalties for, for saying that. I really, really like the book a lot. And, um, and I also have a whole section actually on post-traumatic growth in my new book, Transcend. You know, I actually talk about that quite a bit. It's, it's a topic near and dear to my heart. So I'm so excited that you, you brought that up, Glenn. There's a lot of deep stuff in the flow literature about post-traumatic growth as well. And there seem to be strong correlations, um, though I'd like to look at them much more deeply, between flow states on the back end of trauma rising and post-traumatic growth. It kind of, it makes sense theoretically to me a little bit, but I, I, I haven't seen anything that I can look at and go, oh, this is solid research. Yeah, I don't know of any either. I know personally that even in the, the times that, that I've been in the midst of you know, deep suffering, that I've had something resembling a flow state resembling where where they do have that mental clarity and i think i think it's an awareness i think there's there's part of it is that mental practice to be um, at peace with what is and letting things go which is similar to some of the more positively valenced uh, flow states potentially i don't know if i answer your question at all but you know i've always said for a long time that one of the secrets to my career is i learned how to turn fear into words Mm -hmm. That was right. That was and um and that uh that has worked over and over and over again. Um, it's like fear can be a phenomenal focusing yeah. tool if you can get a handle on it. What do you guys think, or or maybe there's research already around it that are differentiating factors between folks who end up on the PTSD side of the spectrum after a, a phase or period of an adversity versus the post traumatic growth side? Like what what differentiate? Maybe. It's, you know, flow is one. I think Kelly, to Kelly McGonigal talks about gamification actually as a way of being able to transition more so towards post-traumatic growth. She did that after a severe brain injury. But are, are there any other ways that we can do that? Journaling, expressive writing has been shown. Uh, James Pennebaker has done some really good research mm -hmm. along those lines. I really recommend people in this time that we're living in right now to get a journal and to process what else are we doing with our days but but worry? Well, at least make that worry productive. And that's the point that I want to be very clear about. It's not bad that we're all worrying, but actually a certain form of rumination has been shown to make all the difference between those who have post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic growth. You can have productive worry, believe it or not. You don't need to get rid of the worry, but you can try to process it and unload it from your working memory in your journals. Because the more you keep it in your working memory, it all, it all, it all, uh, it has actually more effects on our health and our um, and our epigenetics and all this biological stuff that cortisol, cortisol, yeah, yeah. Building on that, so some of the things that really can protect us from. So for one thing, everybody processes trauma a little bit differently. There are some predictive factors uh, we've studied with the with the work with our work with the. Um, a, with the reconnaissance Marines, but also with the work that I'm doing with the C4 Foundation, which uh, seeks to help Navy SEAL families. Uh, if everybody's listening there, if everybody could at least click over to the C4Foundation.org, take a look, check out what we're doing, I'd really appreciate that. So as part of my work to design the programs that these families would do um, when they come to our ranch in San Diego, was trying to look a little bit more into post-traumatic stress. And we've also been doing this work with the reconnaissance Marines and trying to look at, okay, how, how does the mind work? How does the mental processing of combat and that kind of trauma work? And it, it's, it's just clear that, that I, you can't really draw a line through who will get it, who will not. Um, but certain things can be important protectors from post-traumatic stress. Um, one of which is a childhood of post-traumatic stress is more likely, or a childhood of traumatic memories, you're more likely to develop post-traumatic stress in response to an acute stressor later on. Ah. Um, it doesn't protect. You think, oh, you get a tough, you get a leather neck or some thing, and it, you know, and it, it it turns out the data is not exactly. I don't think this is a done deal in the research, but it's it's some predictive there. And then the other thing that is that we know is that people who are more prone to gratitude show less, not necessarily less proneness to develop post traumatic stress, but less proneness to have the worst effects of post-traumatic stress. So they may still have a diagnosable case, but the effects on their lives are reduced as a result of their proneness to feel gratitude. Maybe that can help us here too, you know, as we're tuning our gratitude antennas. 
it can mitigate PTSD to a degree. Yeah. In anxiety for exams, right? So I taught this to my students last week. A lot of students deal with test anxiety. And what they've actually come to, to do these interventions where it's very simple cognitive reappraisal to think about that anxiety in a constructive manner, to learn to distinguish the worry about your performance, the worry about whether or not you're going to go up or down or sideways, to distinguish that from just the general feeling of anxiety that we all have. I had feelings of anxiety before logging onto this. I have some mild fear of public speaking, but I love it. It's kind of my favorite drug. But I always have a little bit of that anxiety, but I don't worry too much about if I'm going to do a good job or not. Because uh, I've, you know, just because I, I found that that a little bit of this helps me and a little bit of this doesn't really help me very much, right? So there is this reappraisal that that we can think of. We might as well, we're stuck in this soup, right? And it's a crappy soup that we're stuck in, right? Like, it, it's worth thinking, like, maybe just for 30 seconds, can we make peace with it and say, I might be able to get better. And maybe even if we're, we have to suffer some of the terrible consequences of this, of job loss, of personal injury, um, it, you know, even then we might be able to still take 10 seconds to go, okay, maybe there's something I can still learn from this. And then, and then of course, as, as feelings bubble up, they do. Um, but, but that's one of those things that we see that there is um, some ability, some freedom to craft the narrative around it, which is what I think Scott was saying as well it, through post-traumatic growth. Scott, you've made this point in, in your work over and over. A lot of people, when the work on the default mode network started, right, this is your daydreaming network for people who, who are, aren't aware of it. It sort of runs down the middle of your, your brain, sort of a, a midline structure that goes all the way back. People thought, oh, wow, really active default mode network seems to correlate with high depression, which is true, yet creativity requires rumination. So the question I have is, does a gratitude practice give you the ability to ruminate with less negative consequences. Absolutely. And and I am the such a big fan of the default. I, I call it the imagination network. I've renamed it I that know. because it's much sex, much sexier than the default. And the default mode, it's more accurate because the default mode network sounds like it's a passive system. Actually, that brain area or that brain network, which brings together lots oh. of different areas, um, actually, we're, uh, it ha have to do a lot with um, meaning making, and it's very, it's a very active, constructive part. And there's a great myth that that brain network is necessarily associated with negative ruminations. This is getting getting to your point. I wrote an article called The Myth of the Neurotic Creative or something like that, mm. The Myth of the Neurotic Genius. But in there, I talk about how when you actually, when you look at the default mode network research or the imagination network research, you see that neuroticism, the personality trait, is a moderator of whether or not that brain area is going to be tinged by sort of negative thoughts, but the, the default mode network by itself is not like a negative, like that's not its function. Its function is to simulate the future. Now, if you are neurotic AF, you know what I'm saying? Um, then, then, you know, then, then of Hello. course, then of course, hi, raise your, raise your hands, right. raise your yeah. hands, people. By the way. Then your, your default mode network will tend to be, I mean, surprise, surprise, right? That's where you're, that, that's your personality. But it's um, a really great myth that, um, that that is what that brain network's function is. The, the function is just to simulate the future. Um, and there's a lot of my, my mentor, uh, Jerome Singer, is the father of daydreaming. Jerome L. Singer, he just died recently, I think at the age of 90. Um, this is very recently he died and I did like, and, um, and, and anyway, he was so excited to see his research vindicated through neuroscience because he wrote one of the, the, the first book ever on, on the positive aspects of daydreaming. It was literally called Daydreaming and it was in like this late 60s, early 70s, he wrote this book and he, he argued there's positive constructive daydream. There is ruminative daydreaming, and he, he came up with three different daydreaming styles. There's the kind of daydreaming where you can't control your attention, like ADHD kind of daydreaming, you know, um, and there is negative dysphoric. He called it uh, dysphoric, I think, daydreaming. But he also has a style called positive constructive daydreaming. And that um, shows very strong default mode network activity as well. Interesting. I got a, I got a pop psychology question that's like painfully pop psychology. Um, Scott, I would love to hear your breakdown on creativity while in the shower from a <laughs> neuroscientific slash psychological perspective. I don't know why my eyebrows just went up. I said I <laughs> that. Uh, it was <laughs> inappropriate, but um, it, it was it was also involuntary. 
But um, well, okay. So, <laughs> um, the, the, here's the thing. Uh, I've done research uh, with Hans Grower shower heads. We looked all across the entire world. Uh, I mean, we're talking about like hundreds of thousands of participants to ask people when they find their best ideas. And more people reported having inspiration and, and insight in the shower than they did at work. You're reporting have such ideas at work. That's kind of scary. <laughs> scary when you, when you think about it. But I think in a lot of ways, if you can get into a state of a certain brain, a brainwave state, and and Stephen talks about this so beautifully in a lot of his work, he can quant, he can tell you exactly what that is, theta, you know, whatever. You get if you get this particular state, I think I think things like the shower can help, but it's not like just the shower. It's not like I'm making an argument here that like there's something especially unique about being in the shower, but it's being in this state where you're, um, you can relax that prefrontal cortex a little bit, um, mm -hmm. the dorsal, the, well, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So we have a dorsal outer layer and we have like the medial, actually the imagination network is part of the medial, the inside prefrontal the cortex. Yeah, the middle. The lateral prefrontal cortex having to do with um, our, our uh, concentration is a great thing to have, but creativity, uh, tends to rise when it's lowered a little bit, not when it's zero, you know, you don't want to be unthinking completely. That's when you're asleep, but that it's, it, it's relaxed a little bit. And I think that being in the shower can actually contribute to that. Right. And that's probably why other recovery activities are beneficial outside of the actual recovery, like exercise, going for well, a walk. So the other thing is in flow, one of the main triggers we talk about is deep embodiment, engaging multiple senses at once pulls your attention into the present and helps turn off some of that rumination. And in the shower, it's very tactile. You're, I mean, you're getting warm water beating on you, which is an unusual sensation for us, right? That doesn't happen normally. So that always catches our attention. So you see this, you know, in the stage of the flow cycle, you'll, you'll people will be in struggle all day. They'll get back from work. They'll jump into the shower just to wash off the day. And just the like, I'm soaping myself up requires low grade physical movement, but you have to pay attention a little bit. And the water, the combination of that is enough. You know, in creativity research, they talk about this. Scott can speak more about this, obviously, as the incubation phase, right? Point here, uh, right? There are four, the, the classic four stages of the creative cycle. The second one is the incubation phase. It matches with the release phase of the flow cycle. Um, but the deep embodiment trigger seems to work really, really well for the release phase too. like research done by my friend Lee Slodoff found that building model airplanes and building model dinosaurs is perfect for the release phase for foe for the same reason the shower works. It's low grade. You're not really paying attention. You're paying some attention and it's enough to kind of kick it over. Um, I wonder, can we augment the shower with a gratitude practice in the shower? Can we oh, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, you you definitely can, and I think the the one of the key elements of gratitude is that it's a low self criticism practice when you're really having it. There's there's less of this self editing, and it's rare that you're in the shower going, "Is this really the ideal way to so?" You know, like you're you're kind of in that low self edit phase that allows a lot of the better ideas to come that are under that light lightly taxing place. That's where you know restoring cars for me as poorly as I do this, but really? sanding. Yeah, yeah, really? I just, yeah. I just finished painting my truck. Motorhead. Uh, yeah, yeah. I've got a '68 C10, but I'm telling you, it, people got to get out there and work their hands. Um, and something yes. is missing from our society. I mm -hmm. really, anybody here wants to start a Zen monastery that restores cars with me, hit me up. Um, I think it would be <laughs> a very cat. effective place. Yeah, so like Zen in the art of motorcycle maintenance, but yeah. in real life. Um, God, but it's it, too it's, bad I left Chimayo, New Mexico. It was oh, you left what? Chimayo, New Mexico, where I used to live. They call it the hot rod capital of America. There's more kind of oh. like 1920s, 30s, 40s classic mm. cars there and people who know how to work on them. It's, a, it's it, it, There's an amazing. This central part, the medial prefrontal cortex, so important for our socializing, so important for our concept of self, is also the brain region that comes up in just about all 10 or so studies of, of gratitude in the brain. And our study in particular, that, that really looked at the wide range of gratitude always is gonna involve that medial prefrontal cortex. Um, and it's not just because it's a positive, happy region. It's this neat social evaluative reward system processing and it's and it has a motor component as well, right? That's why I think, I think engaging some motor 
components of these positive emotions is so important to build that whole thing. Going back to that embodiment uh, concept that that's come up. Can I ask about Stephen and Glenn, and then obviously Scott? I'd love to hear your thoughts on the research that we're doing on on flow and gratitude and the interrelationship between those two elements. We started by looking at we looked at uh, we had a really good survey, um, and we looked at habit tracking. So what are you doing? We looked at everything from com- what are your spiritual practices, what's your drug use, all that you know to how much sleep are you getting, et cetera, et cetera. And we looked at gratitude and, and flow. And that was sort of where we started. We thought we were going to see what we, our hypothesis was we were going to see a high flow lifestyle correlate with a, with a gratitude practice. And that was pretty clear. Um, the next step where it gets really exciting, we can't do this. The question was, can you use gratitude as an active intervention in a stressful condition so we're going to take people skiing and we're going to you know on the chairlift rides up and by the way we're still going to do this so anyone wants to volunteer and come play let us know um the question was uh, you know on the chairlift if you you know if we're going into harder and harder runs each each time what is we're going to use a gratitude practice versus a breathing practice versus a sham practice and we're going to test them against each other and see if we get if as an, as an acute intervention it'll produce more flow on the runs our theory is that it will that gratitude is not just this practice that you can do that sort of lowers cognitive load and lowers fear and anxiety on a regular basis which obviously helps flow um but that you can actually use it as, as kind of our, our hypothesis is gratitude is a form of cognitive reframing. We think it's the most acute form of cognitive reframing available and thus using it in a crisis situation should tilt you towards a little more flow. Am I, how did I, how did I do Glenn? Perfect. So okay. you yeah. mentioned what the sham practice is first. I think people find it interesting and also yeah. it may not be clear. What you mean that, was Glenn's, that was Glenn's brilliant insight. I'll let him go to that. Well, that's the, the, the biggest challenge in all these studies. If it's a mindfulness study, a gratitude study, anything that involves these cognitive reappraisals, the, the biggest challenge to designing these is always the control condition. It's always compared to what. So in our case, um, you know, with, with gratitude, it's a very hard uh, emotion to control for because what's the element that you really are trying to get at that, that you think is unique about gratitude? that is insofar as it leads to flow. I hope this is making some sense, but so what you need is to have some sort of active, generally positive, but maybe less um, sort of transformational and transportative, transportational um, kind of emotion. Um, So we actually think even some deep breathing would be very interesting. We we wanna run, ideally you'd run three or four different Conditions. Oh, but it, was we the, it was the math. It was math. It was addition, oh, yeah. right? Like we're, math. We're, just was, some sort of we're cognitive we're gonna... busyness task, just so that people are still as engaged in thinking and producing um, um, some sort of, you know, brain map, um, <laughs> and then compare that. So you probably need a couple of conditions, but yeah, it's like how does gratitude itself uniquely predict increased feelings of flow and pleasure and joy while they're out skiing or snowboarding? Um, the the intermix of this gratitude, opioid, opiate, dopamine, adrenaline system is blows my mind. I, I love thinking about it. I don't know what it is. I have no idea, but I, there's something there I'm excited about. When giving a lecture or presentation to a group, what activity can you do together to prime their brain for creativity? What do you think, Scott? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure uh, nothing sprang to mind, so I was. I'm sure there's something good. Jog creativity. <laughs> well, I, a lot of it is is really getting out of like like resetting the clock. You know, getting out of your current state of wherever whatever your your head is in. And sometimes, you know, mo- just movement. Like Kelly McGonigal would would talk about that. You know, it's like just getting out and getting doing some dancing. You know, to begin. Mm-hmm. But also, you can jog your your brain in lots of ways to get into a more divergent thinking mode uh, versus a convergent thinking mode. So you could do maybe some divergent thinking exercises or things like how many uses for a brick are there and, and try to think about that. Or maybe mm-hmm. something like um, ask like a what if or imaginative question, what, what would happen if people could become invisible at will? One of these kinds of items from the Torrance right. test with creative thinking, just to kind of get your, your uh, start rummaging in your default mode network more than your, uh, you know, uh, executive the BA10, you know, all the way up there and the, the meta meta cognitive, you know, 
<laughs> you didn't just drop a Broadman area 10 on us, yeah, did you? Yeah, yeah, I did, I did. It's the, the very, very tip. That's the PA 10 is the very tip of the latest, the latest bit we evolved, yes. you know, in, in the brain. And sometimes that's great and all for creativity, but but if you really want to kind of get in that state as a group, it's it's good to to start, you know, accessing remote associations, not to be so laser focused on the task. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what about introspective awareness and creativity? And maybe related to that question. I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that. Introspective awareness, like uh, our introspection. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, that's a great benefit of solitude. It's a great benefit of, of deep, deep meditation for sure. Uh, but the, the thing, interesting thing is there's different forms of meditation that differentially predict creativity. And this might be useful for your uh, people that are watching this right now to know that. So it's been shown that the kind of return to your breath meditation, uh, this, that's sort of like your standard, you know, if you open up one of these apps, like Calm Map or something, they keep saying over and over again, return to your breath. That actually is negatively correlated with divergent thinking. And it's positively correlated with, it's positively correlated with convergent thinking. Right. But there's a form of meditation called open monitoring meditation it's gone by different names as well. And there's actually at the creativity post, there's an open monitoring meditation that my friend Rebecca recorded. That form of meditation allows you to let your mind wander in any direction and just simply being um, aware to the full breath of, of all the ideas and everything that's going on. That has actually been shown to be positively correlated with a divergent thinking. So my, many people are not aware of that, but there are some, there are some scientific studies showing different forms of meditation predict different kinds of creative of, of stages of the creative process what's your gratitude practice look like what do you do as far as cultivating gratitude in a practical sense for yourself well again it goes back to the antenna analogy um in that i really do make a point to to find a way to appreciate life every day there's something interesting about if you think about it so i'll tell you guys something something more personal but we're expecting our first uh, child very soon here right and I'm I'm thrilled about right, it. It's extremely right. stressful. To, thank you. Yeah, it's extremely stressful to be going through right now. Um, yeah. But um, but we're we're doing it. And my wife is amazing. So there you go. But um, the thing is that when you ask people about that, what is what do people most of the time say about a childbirth? They say, "Wow, what a miracle!" Right. The thing that I've really tried to do is connect. You know, why do we lose that sense of life being a miracle just because we get older? When in fact, the odds of living more and more days are actually increased in the odds of life being a miracle. The odds get more and more amazing the longer you live. And so, for me, it's really about focusing on that idea that every day you can put your feet on the floor and go, "Wow, it's kind of my little minor miracle here." Um, otherwise, I do a sitting a meditation. I we're going to record one for an experiment we're doing where it's a, a gratitude meditation that's focused on um, finding um, things around us that we don't normally associate or think of as as being capable of producing gratitude like this little cap to my little um uh this is a to an adhesive spray that i use <laughs> for, for one of my little projects but um you know you think about the things something around you just look around you there's something around in your office in your near zone that took a lot of effort you know to create, maybe even took the whole world to make this pen if you really think about it, right? So I do a lot of gratitude practice around really trying to thank the whole world for every little thing. Mm. I'm wondering if either of you have comments on gratitude and grief, that may be a more obvious one, but then also Scott, maybe in relation to what you were mentioning earlier around uh, negative or various ranges of emotions and creativity, whether there's an interesting interrelationship between grief specifically and creativity. I'm going to riff on it, um, but but there's a there's a guy Robert Emmons who's probably the, the first and most well known researcher on gratitude. He even talks about about grief as still at least being something that we can be grateful for. As weird as that might sound, that that the mm. feeling of grief also means that we had something of value that we cherish, that we fear its loss, right, and that. When we're grieving the loss of a loved one, you know, when I when I lost my mom some years ago, I really did think of that. That grief was my way of being grateful to her, to say, mm -hmm. to reframe mm -hmm. and reappraise that gratitude to say, this hurts like hell, and that means that I am not taking anyone for granted. Maybe grief can be something that is 
um, a reminder that we are taking things a little more seriously than we thought. And there, there's something, there. this isn't a science thing. This is more just Glenn talking, unless Dr. Fox, so to speak. But I think there is some wisdom in, in taking our grief seriously, labeling it appropriately, and and thinking of it in terms of the benefits that it will have to make us protect the things we so cherish. Oh, can, can I add to that? Please, yeah. Scott, yeah. That, that was beautiful, Glenn, it really was. Um, the thing about, um, about, I wanna just make the point that we don't have to wait until we've lost the thing to have grief for it. Now, let me mm. elaborate what I mean by that. Um, Maslow was working on a series of exercises towards the end of his life uh, that would help us reach higher levels of transcendence and peak experiences and gratitude is a peak experience. And one of those exercises was when you're talking to someone, think to yourself, this might be, what, what if this is the last time I ever talk to this person? What if, you know, do actually do the thought experiment while you're talking to someone at, at the same time where you, you, you snap into the reality of, well, this someday I won't talk to this person, you know, kind of cultivate, that that exercise while the person's still alive and and he argues you'll show much more gratitude and um and enjoyment and, and mindfulness in the moment with this person that you're talking to so i just wanted to add that to this love that yeah they call it i don't know who calls it this but i've heard of some idea similar called the deathbed proxy the idea of just attempting to view things decisions situations even emotions from the perspective of your deathbed as well, which I think can arouse sort of a similar, a similar sense. Just on the grief notes, uh, until the 19, 1960s, grief was viewed as a mental illness. Do either of you have any, any comments or thoughts on that? I've never heard of that, actually. Did, did you hear mm -hmm. that, Glenn? No, I've never heard that. No, I've heard of it for nostalgia. I know that nostalgia, Stalin would murder his, his troops if they had too much nostalgia. Wow. Um, he didn't need much reason, by the way, turns out. <laughs> yeah, um, <exactly. laughs> not, a, not a great guy, but um, it, it, as it happens. But no, so nostalgia, um, I think, had some sort of connotation as being something of a mental disorder. I've never heard of grief as a mental disorder. I certainly wouldn't. I think that of the emotions that that we struggle with, of the negative emotions, Grief, luckily, because we have Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's Five Stages of Grief, is one of the few universal human emotions that we have a good affect labeling system for. That's why, partly why I think those five stages, and they're not stages, by the way, have become so pronounced because it's one of the few things that it works great to be able to label the process of grieving using those specific um, um, components. And so in that regard, I think grief has a somewhat advantage, advantage place in our emotion lexicon because it's one of the few emotions where we really learn to label its parts. Mm. Mm. Interesting. That's great. It's a, just, my, just a hypothesis. For my yeah. Opinion. So interesting one for both of you. And feel free again to veer from scientist to personal with the answer to this one. If you were a world leader right now, how would you structure your day to perform consistently at peak and be focused amidst the noise and make effective decisions? Um, the, the world leader sentence stem just adds a little bit of flair to the question. I think I don't know how it necessarily relates, but I'm I'll take a tip, a sip of my uh, my spiked peppermint tea while. <laughs> just like a world leader would do. Exactly. <laughs> Drink dictator. Oh, that is quite a question. <laughs> Um, it's Scott, you got something on that? <laughs> you know, I'm glad, first of all, I'm glad I'm not a world leader. Um, I'm, I'm glad that I'm a creative, you know, people have to know what their talents are and strengths. I, I structure my day as a creative person, which I'm not saying that's the same thing that I, I would not recommend a world leader to structure their day. Like I structure my day, but the way I structure my day works for me. You know, and this is this is you have to find what works for you in this world. You know what I mean? And so it, the reason why I'm struggling so much with that question is because you're asking 
you know, you're uh, like, who makes me an expert on that question? You know what I mean? I'd be more, I'd be more an expert if you asked me the question, you know, let's say I want to have maximize my creativity during the day. How should I structure it? Then it'd be more in my wheelhouse. But, well, you but you see, you want to take a stab at that question? Because I'm sure. Oh my gosh, I stepped into that one, didn't I? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, yeah, but... uh, the, uh, the biggest thing to structure your life for creativity is to build in opportunities for surprise and inspiration. To, mm -hmm. to to grab you, you know? See, that's the thing. So many people are focused uh, on to-do lists and uh, how can I, you know, hack the day and, uh, and, and then you think about the next day and how you're gonna hack it. I think if you set a basic structure, that's good. But for creativity, you need creativity to breathe. You need you need creativity to, to like, you need to be flexible to changing the task and going back, let's say you have five, six tasks. You have to be very flexible and, and create your day in a way where you can drop task two if it if it requires more incubation period. And you just we do that with self compassion and and with acceptance and awareness and say you know you know what that's that needs incubation, you know. Um, and then you do step five, maybe jump jump in the shower. <laughs> you know, like, but uh, and then and then and then go to back to two later. You know. The thing with creativity is that it's a linear process. It's not, um, I'm sorry, it's not, it's non-linear. It's non-linear. Mm -hmm. And you asked a very linear question, which is why I was uh, saying, maybe I'm not the best one in the world to answer that one. No, well, it's interesting though, on the creativity side. And I'm curious, what are your thoughts on, I don't know if you got to check out Dan Pink's new book, When, um, he talks about optimal yeah. timing for work and focus and productivity and creativity. And he says that we're most creative when uh, usually kind of early afternoon when slightly fatigued do you find that to be the case and do you have any recommendations for structuring a day around that if it is true i mean i definitely find that to be the case i definitely get my best writing done um in the evening when i'm not self-editing a lot yeah, um, right. you know i think to me that's that's the thing is i'm not um I separate my deciding from my doing, which is one of the one of the better you know pop psych phrases to sort of say I'm not going to decide what to do right now. I've already decided that I'm going to spend these two hours trying to do trying to create something, and who cares what happens if I sit here? Fine, but I've decided to to do that. So um, I think a lot of a lot of this really does come from from self knowledge of when you work best. I'm sure many people. I'm I tend to be an afternoon and late night person many people have the same things for the morning i think that the first thing is to keep track i don't think it's very magical um i think using those metacognitive skills to sort of notice when you're feeling motivated write down if you have a good creative workflow maybe jot down keep a journal of when things are good i haven't read dan dan's new book um but i think we we are so trapped in this weird factory model of how we set up our days as if we still work at factories maybe yeah. perhaps one of the best benefits of this pandemic will be to show the future of work as it can be flexible human centered and and you know enhancing our ability to to really work when we feel most productive um i think email by the way i'm just going to say this thing emails by far the death of society we need a new answer to email um yeah. It's not that I mind getting emails. I don't. It's that I. It's probably the opposite. That I'm like, oh, I could do something, and it feels nothing happens. You don't yeah, produce anything. With procrastination. Email. Yeah, yeah. It feels like you're doing something. So I find email to be a total creativity killer. And I hope somebody out there has a new new platform or way to ping each other. That's a little better. Mm. Um, Cal Newport wrote a book called Deep Work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and me and him really got into it uh, on my podcast. He reached out to me because I had written an article. Um, uh, I, the, the title of that article was Creativity is Much More Than 10,000 Hours of Deliberate Practice. And he had written an article about how creativity requires deliberate practice. So he read that. And he's like, you know, maybe we should talk about that. Because we have opposing views on this matter. And we really got into that because I, I really am quite critical of the uh, the deliberate practice zealots, you know, um, they're more just like type A personalities, you know, I don't even know type A is scientifically valid in the literature, but you know, that where we have to be efficient and everything has to be this linear process, but creativity is this like winding, you know, all around curve. 
but I think there is a lot of wisdom. So I, I just want to end this by saying, uh, and what I'm saying, my point here by saying, there, uh, Cal Newport convinced me by the end, uh, by the end of that podcast, that these things can be reconciled with each other, that we can still leave open enough spontaneity in the process, and that deep work is really more about getting rid of all the distractions that um, will not allow us to, uh, to, to be in that full flow absorbs, absorptive state. But he's not saying that within that state, we can't really flow, you know? And that's just what I was criticizing and I wasn't sure if that's what he meant, but I'm glad that he clarified that for me. Interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's about, it's about creating the overall space and that's the structure and then you are creative and more flowy within the structure. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Any insights on creativity and screen flickering and light spectrum of our phones, laptops, and TVs? I, I don't know about, about the creativity itself. I'm more concerned about our actual mental, you know, awareness, the drive to look at our phones. I think one fun thing to pay attention to is the feeling you have before the feeling to pick up your phone. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that that the screen itself is the evil part, although there's there's data to suggest it's not that, that the blue light can can slow down your circadian rhythms and offset things. Um, but I think more more than anything, it's the distractibility. I've installed and deleted Twitter on my phone like 10 times in the last week. Um, and I think that's really where the creativity killer is. Because talk about self-editing. If you're always editing, should I be looking at the news? Should I be looking at the news? You, you won't, I doubt that you can break into a place where you can focus on gratitude um, or some of these states that will help help us connect with this present moment. That was beautiful, by the way, that was beautiful. I'm going to actually, I'm going to be, you know, your, your audience is going to be the first ones in the entire world to see the revised yeah, hierarchy of needs for the first time in eight, 70, <laughs> 75 years. So instead of a triangle that Maslow never even drew, okay, it turns out he never viewed life like a video game, like, you know, you have, you reach one needs like safety and then some voice from above is like, congrats, you've unlocked, you know, esteem, you know, and, and then you go up a level. It actually is much more, makes much more sense to conceptualize it as a sailboat. The boat of the sailboat is security and you don't fully open up your sail and move anywhere um, until you feel safe and secure in that boat, right? So it shows that the sailboat illustrates much better Maslow's distinction between deficiency and growth. And that's really the essence of what he was trying to get at. So, and then at the top from the viewpoint of the seagull is transcendence mm. or the seabird. Um, transcendence is an emergent property of an integration of our whole self in the service of realizing the good society. That's how I define transcendence. Mm. So, so there, I, I, I did it. <laughs> I don't what, know what you all what, think. What was, your, what was your own biggest learning while writing your new book? I had so many insights. I read Abraham Maslow's, uh, all of his un, unpublished uh, journals, personal journals, 2000 pages. Wow. I, real, I realized that he was working this whole theory, which I talk about called Theory Z. Um, which is a theory of transcendence and higher states of consciousness, higher reaches of human nature. Um, I had I realized that his framework of deficiency versus growth can be applied to anything in life, and it it transformed my life. It it I start to see everything in that way now, and nothing in itself is good or bad. At this higher state of consciousness, at the highest state of consciousness, all these we have dichotomy transcendence, which is what Maslow called it. So all these dichotomies we have in our society you know, good versus evil, Republican versus Democrat, uh, all these things don't don't make sense anymore. Selfish versus non-selfish at the highest level of integration of needs, your selfishness is good for the world. So therefore the word selfishness doesn't make sense anymore. So mm -hmm. all these all these things break down at the highest level. So my whole world has changed and I'm just so excited to share this with the world. I actually give a big shout out and my acknowledgements to, to Stephen Kotler. Nice. Uh, uh, I always love, I love flowing with him about this topic of flow, but the, uh, I, I could flow as part of the concept Maslow talked about peak experiences, but I view peak experiences as a, as a broader label. Uh, so we can have trans a whole continuum. I, I talk about the unitary continuum of transcendent experiences that can go and flow is actually on the lower end of the continuum. And not saying it's it's uh, calm down, uh, Stephen. And not saying that means yeah, it's, exactly. it's not, not. I'm not saying it's not as good. It's not. It's not a competition. It's not dropping an angry email right now. <laughs> no, but it's uh, but it's uh, in the whole continuum. You can build up to to um, the most profoundly transformative 
transcendent experiences where our entire uh, entire worldview and sy system of life has changed for us. And um, we have this, uh, what are called sometimes called a mystical experience, mm -hmm. you know, um, but, but the, all there's gradations all along this, uh, this, this pathway. And I talk a lot of about that continuum in the book. Amazing. Thanks Scott. So guys, I'm going to do one question from Steven here, and then I want to fire two more at you and then we can wrap up if that works for both of you. And before we wrap up Perfect. as well, I would love, love for you both to just share more about where people can dive deeper into both your work. So this one's for Scott, but Glenn, I'm sure you've got some thoughts as well. Scott, which of the humanist psychologists do we know the least about, but are potentially the most important? Karen Hornay yeah. is the most underrated psychologist in the history of psychology, and especially within the humanistic movement. She was the first humanistic psychoanalyst. Take that phrase, you don't hear that one often. Freud was definitely not a humanistic psychoanalyst. Yeah. He believed that all of our at, at, the, at its base, everything can be chalked up to our either sexual or aggressive instincts, including our transcendent. Most, he would say that our most transcendent experiences, like the mystical experience, he called it an erotic return to the womb. That's what he called mm -hmm. it, okay? Karen Horney had a much more constructive, positive view of humanity. She believed that we we're capable of growth and change up to the end of our death. By the way, she was also a feminist psychoanalyst and she was the first one to challenge Freud and say that he was nuts. <laughs> you know, like, um, so I think she's really underrated, but I also think like Roald May is incredibly underrated. You, you may have heard of the, 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 the classics like Carl Rogers, Eric Fromm, uh, Abraham Maslow, but Roald May uh, wrote beautiful things. He wrote the book Love and Will, for instance, which is absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. Also, right. Alfred Adler, I, I can yeah. keep going on and on and on, but Alfred Adler <laughs> was amazing. You got any, Glenn? Oh, un unheralded humanistic psychologist? Yeah. Um, no, I wouldn't, I don't, um, I wouldn't, I don't know if I consider myself a humanistic psychologist per se, although I probably am. Um, but I do think if you're interested in research on optimism, there's a researcher named Lisa Aspinwall who has done a ton of great research. And I don't know where she is or what she's doing. She did a lot in the 90s to really hash out what we know about optimism as a cognitive um, you know, um, framing toolkit. And I just, her, her research is, is um, fantastic, easy to read, very accessible. And I think, I think worth, worth a read if you wanna dive into literature. Super, okay, that's helpful. So second last question then that I'm really curious on from both of you. Both of you have incredible minds and have read God knows how many books and papers. So I'm curious what belief or skill has been most helpful to each of you? Is it too corny to say mindfulness? Because I feel like that's the answer to everything these days, but I actually really do mean that. I have found that the this practice and this constant practice of decoupling my thoughts and my fears and anxieties mm. from myself and projected onto a screen when I, when I, when I close my eyes, I, I don't do the return to breath one as much as I do in terms of trying to de take all my mashugana as my grandmother would say, and, and, and pretend that I'm viewing it on a screen, like a movie. Uh, and it's a horror movie, <laughs> but, but, but it's not me, right? It's the movie. Yeah. Yeah. If, I, if I do that 15, 20 minutes a day, I'm in a much better, loving, calm state the rest of the day. No, that's super helpful. I think so. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Great. Um, you know, I probably have the same same answer. Um, I would call what I'm thinking a lot about is curiosity, and that that staying curious about this moment has been really interesting, a, a great way to cope. I do. I'm I'm fortunate in that I I spend my life thinking about how the mind works. And so the quarantine is just a, is, is another way to do that. I also, um, I guess the other skill I have is that I like to build things. So it's kind of handy that I can work in the shop a little bit. Um, and that's that's definitely the skill that's been the most useful is being able to, to still be creative, to still work with my hands. Um, I'm trying to get good at CNC machining things. So <laughs> I have a little CNC machine in my background. I don't know if you could see it um, there. Oh, cool. um, and uh, so I've been playing with that, but I think curiosity as a, as a general trait, um, I loved Scott's tweet earlier, ravenous curiosity, because I really think it solves a lot of problems. 
when you can be curious about pain, curious about suffering, um, it, it, it does separate things that, that's that internal suffering story from just curiosity about like, wow, this hurts. This sucks. Interesting. Mm. It sucks that it's, you know, it doesn't suck that I think that it sucks. It just sucks, you know, and that, that to me has been the most useful coping mechanism. Well, one thing I just want to mention on Scott's front is um, that some people are already pre-ordering your new book. A big mission of mine is, is to help, is to show people is to suggest to people that they don't neglect their higher possibilities. So I understand in the time we're living in, it's we're we're all being pitched into a state of psychological insecurity, what some psychologists call psychological entropy. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't we have we we must make sure that we don't snap so focused into that state that we forget that there still exists beauty in this world. There still exists beauty within us. I want to leave, I thought I'd leave the last words to my, my homeboy, uh, Abraham Maslow, uh, who I mentioned 500 times today, but I rounded up a bunch of, he died suddenly of a heart attack at the age of 62. And he, very end of his life, he was working on a whole series of exercises to help people live more in the bee realm of human existence, the being realm, the realm of where growth happens, as opposed to the deficiency realm. We're all living in the deficiency realm right now, but I want to help people and show people we can still live in the bee realm. At the same time, we, we take care of our basic needs. There's still um, higher possibilities. So I just want to read one of the exercises. Engage in deliberate experimental philanthropy. If sometimes you are no good for yourself, depressed, anxious, at least you can be good for someone else. Mm. So I wanted to, wanted to leave with that. I love that. That's great. It's so good. What a great plug for the book as well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You all have been doing a much better job plugging my book than I have plugging my book today. So I just want to thank everyone. I, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's such a, such a honor to, to, to be here today with everyone. Glenn, you want to share any ways people can dive deeper or support? Whether it's the sure. And sure. Then- I mean, yeah, definitely. If, if people can, can plug into C4 foundation, um, dot org and support Navy SEAL families, those, those guys are still, shipping over and the spouses are here. Um, the stress on them is, is immense. Really proud of the work that we're doing there. Um, so, so jump over and, and give them a like or follow. If you want to observe my random ramblings on Twitter, I'm the least branded person on Twitter. I tweet about cars and whatever uh, <laughs> things, but I'd love if somebody would like respond every once in a while. <laughs> and I don't, it's fine. I, I, if you want to join me, I'm at Glenn R. Fox. Um, and then um, on LinkedIn, I'm I'm a little bit more more active there, but uh, um, I still enjoy Twitter very much. So I'd love to make some new friends that way. Um, so hit me up, go support C4, and please everyone just take deep care for yourselves. I really appreciate the comments um, and the thoughtfulness behind behind this. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to sit with with Scott, whom I admire so much, and Stephen wherever he went. Um, and, and just really grateful for the chance to, to sit with you all and especially to the folks out there who, who are listening. Thanks so much guys. You've been amazing and huge thanks to the whole flow research collective crew as well. All of our team, shout out to Claire, Brent, but also a huge thanks to our whole audience and all of you guys for joining and until next time, all the best folks. If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people. Thank you.